G'day dear viewers, welcome back to Ross and Jono. Last week, uh, we were discussing to borrow a phrase from the Moses Scroll, uh, what I like to call the men of the rebellion. The men of the rebellion in Berlin who uh, made up their mind before they had even seen the scroll to determine it a forgery, while still offering Moses Shapira a uh, making making an offer on the scroll for purchase. Um, so That's right. Uh, you got to take that into consideration. And so with that, he decided he would go to London. That's where we find ourselves today. And today we are introduced to people such as Sir Walter Besant. Um, we are reintroduced to Captain Claude Conda, and we are introduced to uh, Dr. G David Ginsburg. Um, fascinating people. Uh, a few others along the way. What goes on at the PEF? We're going to be get getting into all of that very, very soon, Ross. But before we do that, uh, we find ourselves knocking on the door of an anniversary. It's this time of year that we, a particular date that we are approaching that is significant to this story uh, as a whole. Do you, want to, do you want to let us know what that is? Yeah, uh, that's a great lead in. Actually, uh, this particular date that you're speaking of has two things which make it very, very important in the Shapira story. The first is that in 1883, on the 8th of March, we believe is when Shapira died. Notice mm. I said, we believe that's when Shapira died. It's because we know the date that he was found in the hotel room in Rotterdam. Uh, and we know the last time, according to the reports, that he was spotted by other guests of the hotel uh, that he was staying at in Rotterdam. So we can put it together based on the police report and the report of the people in the at the hotel and so forth. So that's the one thing. So in a way, it's a sad day. March the 8th is a sad mm -hmm. day in that sense. Uh, and then we're going to get to all of the details surrounding the death of Shapira. But the other thing that I think is very important um, involving the 8th of March is that in 1889, Five years to the day of his death, a meeting was held in Burton-on-Trent at a Masonic Lodge. Now, this is going to come back in, too. Notice, whenever you say Freemasonry, sometimes you can start thinking about, wait a minute, this might be a little bit of conspiracy going on here. You know, everybody loves a good story about the Masons. So on the mm. 8th of March, 1889, five years after he died, in a Masonic Lodge in Burton-on-Trent, the 15 leather strips were seen for the last time that we know of together. Uh, there was being held at that time a meeting of a certain group. The last known possessor of these uh, 15 leather strips was giving a talk. Notice the, the talk was called The Forgery of Shapira Strips, The Forgery. Mm. So the last known possessor, we believe, thought that they were forgeries, and he gave a talk uh, on that night. So last night that they were seen together, as far as we know, and the date of Shapira's death, and that's coming up. So I'm glad you pointed that out. That's, that's uncanny, isn't it? So there's five years between um, the, the last we see of Shapira and the last we see of the scroll. Um, it, it just, uh, I, I can't help but think about uh, when Shapira first went public with his uh, scroll and uh, with, with Schlotman at least, sending him a, a transcription of it and uh, putting it in a, a bank vault for five years and then eventually taking it out and going to Europe and um, Leipzig, Berlin, and now here we let, are in London. Let, um, me, let me read one paragraph, Jonah. Sorry, let, let me read one paragraph from the ahead. Moses scroll about this particular date. Mm. I said, we, we may never know some of the details surrounding the tragic death of Shapira. What we do know is that the whole affair took place in the span of a single year. Mm. Shapira had reported that it was around Easter of 1883 when he withdrew the leather strips from Jerusalem Bank Vault. Easter that year was Sunday, 25 March, or 16 Adar 2nd on the Jewish calendar, which was Shushan Purim. Shapira would be found dead almost a year later on the 9th of March, 1884, the 12th of Adar on the Jewish calendar. Interestingly, uh, interestingly the Torah reading for the Sabbath of his death, Jonah, was Ki Tisa, 
which ends with Moses in possession of a second set of stone tablets Mm -hmm. containing the words of the covenant. Moses Shapira also had presented to the world a second set of those words. Mm. So I just find it, it, it's uncanny, not only uh, the death of Moses Shapira tied to the last known sighting, but even along with the Torah portion, you know, I mean, some people might say, oh, you're making a little bit more out of that than, but I just find it uncanny. Very Mm. interesting. Mm. Yeah, yeah, one can't help but uh, uh, think very deeply on all of that. Um, All right, so, so keeping that in mind, uh, we've oh, and just to let everyone know, just in case they're just tuning in, Ross, this is the book, of course. Uh, That's that right. You, your fine self penned. Um, this is our textbook, and we're today, uh, as I mentioned, we're um, we're in the what is this now? The sixth chapter? Are we in the fifth or the sixth? That's right. Chapter chapter six. The mm-hmm. English scholars. The English Eng- scholars. English scholars. This is where we are. Um, and we are working our way through. And the reason why we're working our way through the book once again is because, of course, uh, in the last few years, you've happened upon a whole lot more information that you we're now weaving into the story as we go through it right. in detail. Just let everybody know, once again, hardcover, uh, paperback, uh, Kindle, and now an audio version. You can find it on Amazon. All right. So um, the, the the Palestine Exploration Fund, Ross. First of all, what what is this? When when was it founded? What is its purpose? Uh, it was actually founded in 1865, so not too much before the events that we're dealing with in in our ongoing saga. But in 1865, about the time that the entire world, in in some ways, was beginning to make inroads into the Holy Land, as we often say, they're they're approaching the Holy Land with the Bible in one hand and a spade in the other. Mm. Well, all of the nations of the world. Uh, the major groups, anyway, not only the the Brits, but the Eng- the so the English, the Germans, the Russians, different people, and even later the Americans. They come right on the heels of this. They all had these societies for studying uh, archaeology in the Holy Land and so forth. So the the British founded the PEF Palestine Exploration Fund in 1865, and it's this group that is going to play heavily into the story. And so Shapira arrives at the headquarters Mm. of the Palestine Exploration Fund on uh, July the 20th of that year. And he arrives unannounced. I was just going to say, he arrives unannounced. Um, Again, he's he's very emboldened because uh, uh, Maya, Guta, Ehrman, uh, receiving very um, uh, positive uh, feedback from them and awaiting their uh, printed review, um, he's he's very um, confident. So he arrives unannounced. And what I'm curious about, Ross, is why does he go there first when he is a correspondent of the of the uh, British Museum? And we're to, we're to understand that he has supplied the British Museum not with dozens of manuscripts, but in fact hundreds, right. um, perhaps right. over 300 manuscripts, so almost half of that um, Karaite. Uh, manuscripts, and uh, which I believe Ginsburg, we'll talk about that later, spent a long time studying. But um, why does he present the scroll to the PEF and not go directly to the museum? Is, a re- is there a reason for that that you know of? You know, the it, we don't know for sure. What we do suspect, or what I suspect, is that uh, this is the group. This is the group, and, and it's a small group. In other words, those who would be connected to the British Museum uh, are also connected to the PEF. It's, okay. it's a small group of scholars. Mm-hmm. You, you might go to one office, and, and there you would find some of these folks, and you go to the other office, and you'd find the rest right. of them. But it seems that the Palestine Exploration Fund, Walter Besant in particular, mm is already uh, established himself as the person that you work through for these great archaeological discoveries. So let me make this point. For instance, when the uh, Mesha stone, the Mesha stella, was discovered in 1868, August of 1868, it was through the scholars that worked at the PEF, primarily through Besant, mm-hmm. that pictures were photos and, and uh, or sketches were distributed to all the scholars in England. So I assume that when Shapira 
uh, approaches the Palestine Exploration Fund office, he knows that's where you go if you've got a great announcement. Now, okay. I'm not going to necessarily jump right into this, but I will say that I had two main pieces, two uh, sources for Chapter 5 in my book, main. Now, that doesn't mean I don't have others. Mm. One is an autobiography of Sir Walter Besant, mm -hmm. which I have here, and I'll read from some of that in a little while. And the other is an account by a, a man by the name of William Simpson um, that, that was dated in January of 1884. He was in a certain meeting, which we'll begin to discuss momentarily. Uh, so, so Walter Besant is the man uh, of the hour. Can you uh, introduce us to him, give us a little bit more detail as to why he has the position that he has? Well, he's, he's known as a brilliant writer, for one. Uh, he assumes this position, and he, hel he holds it for quite a few years. Uh, he, he is, there are a lot of people in Victorian England that I think might be uh, good candidates for a position like this. But he's very connected, not only intellectually and not only uh, per his education, but he's, he's in with the people. In other words, the upper echelon, the upper crust of society. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to talk a few, I'm going to mention a few connections to uh, the Masonic fraternity in the 19th century as we go through this. Uh, and, and this would be one that's very important to this. Uh, Walter Besant happens to be a very important person uh, in Freemasonry, not only at the time, but even today he's known. I, I put this in the book. He was a past master of Marquis of Delahousie Lodge and one of the founders of the first Masonic Research Lodge known as the Quator Coronati Lodge, number 2076. Okay, so, so this let me... is. Yeah, I was yep. just going to say yep. now. Now, back back in the day, almost everyone uh, of note would have been a Freemason. Um, yeah, those uh, uh, I was going to say qualifications, but the the connections that you just read of the positions rather. Um, why are they particularly uh, important, and how would he be distinct? Well, I, I tell you, he's in a very key position, and one thing that we'll touch on, in fact, I'm doing research on this piece of the puzzle right now and, and hope to have an article at some point uh, on this connection, but I'll say that almost anyone and everyone who was of note in the 19th century, particularly as those that were involved with the Shapira affair, are all involved in Freemasonry, and that includes that includes people like William Simpson, who we'll talk about, Condor, and and quite a few of these others. They're, they're even meeting in Jerusalem, and you and I have been at a place where they met in Zedekiah's cave. Remember in that that trip a few years ago. So Walter Besant, uh, he later records. Now one of the things that is interesting. Uh, one of the things that's interesting about uh, the autobiography is some of the details are off. Now, he writes this autobiography. You and I were talking about this off air. Uh, he writes this autobiography sometime at uh, much later in life. So he, he doesn't remember all the details very well. I think you but said it was uh, published to... in 1902. Is that right? Yeah, 1902. Yeah. That's right. Hmm. So this is quite a bit of time afterwards. But but one thing that I wanted to say is that he's lost uh, some memory of the details. And, and how do I know that? Because we know the details from other sources. So just to, just to kind of touch on what I mean by that, um, here Besant says, some years later, I think about 1877. So he's lost a few years because this is 1883. A certain Shapira shows up on the doorstep, basically. All right. So, uh, but he, again, he is very connected in English society. He's a well-known writer. He's he's known for uh, his work on on these other great archaeological discoveries, and he's established himself as a leader uh, in the world of biblical research through these connections. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. fascinating, fascinating figure. So upon uh, uh, arriving unannounced and meeting with Walter Besant, he talks to him about uh, what he's carrying in his bag. It, it, 
it, it always amuses me that he's just carrying this thing in a bag. Uh, Shapira is yeah. just around around Europe. Um, <laughs> one of the most important, you know, documents of all time, just carrying around in his bag. Um, right. And Basant uh, insists, "Show me, show me what this is." And um, I don't know that that Shapira was ready for a um, uh, putting on a show right there and then, but uh, he does show him a piece, does he not? Yeah, he he does, but he's reluctant because it. I got the impression, and I tried to write this into the story. When you read the account of Basant, even given that he's off on a few of the details, mm. you get the impression that Shapira, even though we believe it's authentic, he's still a showman. He's still mm -hmm. a salesman. He and and by the way, he's he's pumped up. He just left Germany. Now, the Berlin meeting didn't go as well as he had hoped, but mm. he still knew. In fact, he says uh, that when he was in Germany, he said Professor Goethe believed in him, and he, he refers to a guy that is related in the sources as Professor Hermann. Mm. But I think that that is a Ehrman. mishearing of Ehrman. Yeah, he's, mm. he's saying Professor Ehrman and Goethe, they both believe they're authentic. So he's on a high. He's no longer taking blows from people like Schlotman who say this is – get that, un, uh, that, that fake thing out of here. He mm -hmm. doesn't care about what people like Schlotman and, and Strock and some of these because he's confident it's real now. So, so he, he, he comes – yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, so he does want to, so he shows Basant, he said, look, this is what I've got. Here's an example of it. Um, uh, and he requests uh, a meeting of the scholars. And one of the first names that he asks for is Captain Claude Condor. Now, we've spoken about Condor before um, yeah. in relation to the Moabitica. And I think, did he not show up also during the uh, excavation of the uh, Hezekiah's Tunnel and, and discussion revolving the Siloam inscription? Am I right about that? He, you're exactly right. Not only did he show up, but he. This is uh, by the time he shows up in May of 1880, um, May of 1881, mm. the world is debating what this thing means, and there are people like Archibald Sacy and Neubauer mm. and people who are publishing on the Siloam inscription. When he gets to Jerusalem, the Condor. He had been absent from Jerusalem for several years, and he mm. meets a team there, we'll quickly say, uh, among them Hermann Goethe, the German, uh, uh, Conrad Schick, the man on the ground in Jerusalem, mm. and Shapira. And Shapira says, look, I think Sacy's wrong, and he gives him his interpretation. Jonah, we now know that Shapira was the first who uh, discovered the meaning of the Siloam inscription. And it was Claude Condor, Condor writes right. about that. Mm -hmm. That's right. He's the only one That's that right. gives him the gives him the credit. Uh, so it's perfectly yep. understandable that um, uh, that Shapiro would request his presence. Um, he was two, also two things. Yeah, go he's ahead. Al I was just going to say yeah. he's also quite the uh, accomplished artist, and uh, and he and he even drew some of the uh, Moabitica that um, uh, that Shapira had acquired and sold to <laughs> Schlotman. Anyway, right. uh, so there's that. So who else does he want there? What, one thing before before we get into the meeting, mm. there are a couple of quotes that we see in the autobiography of Sir Walter Besant. Evidently, at least according to the memory of Besant, he had with him, he said, this is Shapira, a document which would simply make students of the Bible and Hebrew scholars reconsider their ways. Mm. It would throw a flood of light upon the Pentateuch and so on. What was his discovery? First, he wouldn't tell me, and then I said he might go away. In other words, he, he's like, come on, Shapira, out with it. And when Shapira finally, you know, uh, Besant had to say, you either show me the document or get out of the office. He's that fired up. So he told me it was nothing less than a contemporary copy of the book of Deuteronomy written on parchment. A contemporary copy, exclamation. Could mm. I see it? I might see a piece which he pulled out of his pocketbook. I, it was written on in fine black ink as fresh after 3,000 years as when it was laid on and in the Phoenician characters of the Moabite stone. And then he goes into more detail. All right. Now, so he, 
Yeah. No, I was just going to say, okay, so now this is reminiscent of Guter's book, is it not? Because uh, there are clearly places uh, in Bassan's autobiography where he speaks of the document as, as unquestionably genuine uh, and unquestionably authentic. And then in other places, Ross, uh, he will concur with the powers that be, uh, the men of the rebellion, if you like, and say, "Oh, but of, of course it's a forgery." Is that the impression? I mean, yeah. you've read you've read the autobiography. Is, is it? Yeah. Is it? Yeah. Is it like it, that all the way through? It it really it's almost like when I first read this, I got excited because he's speaking mm. very favorable, but at the same time. He's pressured, I think, because of the outcome of these investigations that we're going to get into, to ultimately come to the uh, uh, conclusion that it's a forgery. But mm. when you read the blow by blow as things unfold, the uh, chronological sequence of things, you, you have to wonder, that they're open at first to this being authentic. I mean... In other words, I have Bassant's letter where he sends it out to these other scholars. at the t And he doesn't claim to be a scholar who can make this determination, but he's willing to consider that, it, uh, that it's authentic. But it, at times, he's also inclined to say, but it turned out to be a fake, right? So mm -hmm. it is a mixture. It's both. It's mm -hmm. both. We see both. Okay, uh, so he crafts an invitation on paper bearing the uh, PEF yep. letterhead, and and what does it say? Basically, he says, uh, Mr. Shapira, I'm reading it, uh, Mr. Shapira of Jerusalem has brought to England an old Hebrew manuscript, apparently mm -hmm. of great antiquity, containing the text of Deuteronomy with many important variations. He will bring the manuscript to this office on Thursday next, the 26th, at 12 a.m. I'm going to come back to that. Midnight. And we'll be very glad if you can meet him in order to see it. So what's interesting is uh, when I first read this letter, and I became introduced to this letter from uh, Hanan Tigay's book, he puts this beautifully written story about how they convened a meeting at the stroke of midnight. Mm. It's a secret meeting. I and love all this. All these people. All the Freemasons come at midnight and they all the Masons by coming in at midnight. Peace. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> this is, this is yeah, great. That's midnight right. viewing. All Man, right. I'm telling you, if you're going to make a movie, do it like this. Yeah, this is great. It's people like me that are historians that say, well, that's, is, that's kind of strange. Did they is, really meet at midnight? Did they really, Russ? So. But they didn't. I'm sorry oh, to disappoint you. <laughs> I went into, I found a uh, file where uh, Bassant is answering this question later. Here's my footnote in the book. Mm. Uh, the invitation clearly reads 12 a.m., but it is confirmed in a later note by Bassant that the meeting took place at noon and not midnight. So he just, you know, he put a.m., he meant p.m. Mm -hmm. Okay. So at 12, he sends this invitation out, and what happens from that point is that this gets shared around. So it, it wasn't, it, it's funny because later uh, Bassant will report that it was like uh, uh, Ginsburg took his invitation as an opportunity to invite others, and before long, the place is just filled with virtually a who's who of everybody who's anybody. And anybody who's uh, any, okay, yeah. all right. Everybody who's anybody yeah. uh, turns up, and uh, uh, they all have the buzz of of uh, the, now. Has word traveled from Berlin by this stage, or or Shapiro's just uh, no, no. As far as far as we know, Berlin. Now this is where the story gets kind of funny in the sense of what who knew what when. Mm. So. After Shapira leaves Berlin, remember the meeting in Berlin was on the 10th of July. By the 20th mm -hmm. of July, he's in London. So he took a little time to get there, and he goes to the uh, British Museum. Uh, I'm sorry, to the uh, PEF headquarters. PEF. And, 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 but it's been a little while, but, but, what, um, uh, but what, we, what we now know is that there, um, there is this ongoing tension, but we don't know exactly what happened in Berlin if we're in London. So later this becomes a debate. Uh, Delich and some of the other Germans said that they notified people in England, heads up, Shapiro's coming at you with a fake. 
But but we don't know that that letter ever got written, and we don't have any record of it. And the Germans, in fact, the British later will say that the Germans were wrong for not telling them that they had just spent all this time looking at it. Mm-hmm. So the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing, is what I'm saying. Okay. All right. Very good. Now, you've already mentioned uh, Christian David Ginsburg. Um, so uh, Besant and Condor have, have, have looked over this. Um, they've organized the meeting. and. This is the man. And and it's interesting, Ginsburg and Shapira have some things in common as well, don't they? And not only do they yeah. have some things in common, but of course, uh, their fields of expertise overlap a little bit as well. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, several things bring them together. Uh, mm. Shapira knows Ginsburg from a few years earlier than this, where Ginsburg was also one of these who went to the uh, Holy Land in search of various items east of the Jordan Rift, and and uh, so he's connected in that sense. Ginsburg went and visited Shapira's shop and saw some things there, some antiquities, but okay. he was also connected on a couple of other points. The first, uh, I guess, would be uh, that they were both interested in the Siloam inscription. Mm -hmm. They were both interested in the Moabite stone. So they they connected on various things. They knew one another. Mm. I don't know how closely they were uh, connected in terms of friendship, but one thing is for certain, and that is that Ginsburg was a manuscript specialist. You mentioned this just a, a few minutes ago, if I recall. And, and one thing that Ginsburg was very keen on was studying Karite manuscripts, uh, looking at the textual transmission of these Karite manuscripts. And mm. Shapira had already, by this point, sold an extensive library of Karite manuscripts 145. to the British. Yeah, to the British mm. Library. And so Ginsburg. I'm sure, just like other scholars of the day, had a lot of respect for Shapira when it came to manuscripts. Now listen, here's something that I think is a very fair assumption. Shapira is known to Ginsburg as a manuscript guy. If he tells Besant, I've got something that's going to make scholars uh, you know, lose their mind when they, this is such an, it's going to cast a light on the Pentateuch, Mm. I think that Ginsburg is probably very excited about this meeting, and that is why this is what uh, Besant would write about when Ginsburg got the letter. He says, Ginsburg considered the invitation including his friends, that the invitation included his friends, and so the whole of the British Museum, so to speak, with all the Hebrew scholars in London turned up. Everybody turns so, up. So if, if uh, Christian David Ginsburg is interested, everybody's interested and they all turn up. Um, and yeah. Another thing, of course, that they have in common, Ross, is that both yeah. uh, Shapira and Ginsburg are Jewish. And not only are they both Jewish, but they're both Jewish converts to Christianity, correct? That's right. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yep. Good point. Yeah, they both, uh, and we're going to see that they aren't treated equally, uh, but they they should be in many respects because mm-hmm. they're both from an area which would now be uh, uh, around the area of what we would call Western Ukraine. So they come from the same place. Mm -hmm. They're from the same extraction, meaning they're both Jewish. They're both converts. They're both fascinated with manuscripts. There's a lot in common here. These guys could have been best of friends if uh, a different situation had been around. Sure. Sure. All right. So, uh, listen, there's a few other names that you mentioned, particularly on 51 of your book. Uh, do you want to touch on any of these names of, of people that were in attendance? i tell you, just just hitting a couple of those, you see Budge. We know uh, Ernest A. Wallace Budge, the great Egyptologist. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have books in my library with his name on it. Um, and then you have Professor William Aldous Wright, uh, I mean, it was just so many of these scholars, Thomas Hader Lewis. Now, I happen to know, even though I didn't know who he was early on uh, in my Shapiro research, but I've come to have uh, a good bit of respect, and I've, I've seen that there's a lot more to this William Simpson character than meets the eye. But William Simpson is one of the guys who is at the meeting. He is an executive officer 
of um, the Palestine Exploration Fund. He's also connected with the other boys, being that he is a Freemason. He's mm-hmm. part of this group. In fact, of those in attendance at this meeting, almost most of them are uh, from the same Masonic order. You know, they're all involved in the same lodge. It's a mm-hmm. really interesting, you know, you have to wonder, huh, wonder what's going on here. Yeah, right. Part of the answer to that is less of a conspiracy and more of, as you pointed out, 19th century London, you know, if you're anyone of repute, you're probably involved in, in the fraternity. It's, so. the, it's the boys club, yep. you know, and, and, and yep. they're all a part of it. Uh, everybody turns up, and this is an interesting, uh, and I, I guess you get most of this from Simpson's um, uh, account. Um, yep. A, an interesting display that uh, Shapira puts on here. Um, it says in the book here that he uh, he almost takes it out of his bag and, and tosses it before them on the desk. Is that is that the way that you understand this to happen? Yeah. Can can I read? It's it's kind of lengthy, but can I read his Go account, ahead. Simpson's account? This is this is what happens in the meeting, according to William Simpson. He says, uh, the circular of the Palestine Exploration Fund was the first notice I had of the Shapiro manuscript. It had been shown to Walter Besant and Captain Condor previously, Mm -hmm. but the meeting at the Palestine Exploration Fund office may be called its first appearance in England at which I attended, and I propose here to give a few notes of what took place on that occasion, as it was not described in any of the published notices at the time. This is uh, so he's saying, it, "Look, this wasn't published. I was in the room. Here's what happened. This was mm-hmm. so important." Mister Bond and Mister Butler of the British Museum were of the small party. D. Ginsburg. W. Aldous Wright, W. E. Budge, and others, perhaps about 10 persons altogether. W. Besant, uh, Professor Hayter Lewis, and myself, as well as W. A. Wright of the uh, Executive Committee of the Palestine Exploration Fund were present. Mr. Shapira produced a small glazed bag, the small carpet bag of the period, from which he drew forth the pieces of very dark looking leather threw them in a very jaunty manner on the table, round which we all stood. See, this is the image I have in my book. They're all standing around. Mm. Um, uh, With these were some fragments of Hebrew manuscripts, upon which, uh, one of which was rolled up in a rude way and suggested from its shape and color the unsmoked half of a gigantic cigar. We're going to come back to that. (laughs) Okay, yeah. Uh, uh, which I suggested must have been left by Og, king of Bashan. This William Simpson's kind of a joker. He's like, look, it looks like a cigar. He's, right. he's the bad kid in the class. He's whispering to his neighbors. Right. Uh, with them were also small cups or bottles seemingly of stone with Phoenician characters on them. I assumed that all these were authentic and were meant to give us an air of reality to the whole. Can I, can I interrupt the, you just for a second? Yep. Sorry to interrupt. Yep. So what you're telling me is that he hasn't, in his bag that he's carrying around, it's not just, uh, it doesn't just contain the Moses scroll. There's some other artifacts oh, yeah. that he's putting on display as well. Didn't know that. I yeah. didn't know that. Go ahead. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, this, this is cool. And by the way, I want to say this before I get to this point in the letter. This is written in January of 84 after it's already been declared a forgery. So you have to play. Okay, so here we go. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. As the letters on the Deuteronomy manuscript were not very distinct, Shapira produced a bottle of spirit and a hair pencil, and he washed them over with this so that the characters could be more clearly seen. To anyone unaccustomed to precious documents, the rude way Shapira handled and rubbed these pretended old fragments was, uh, had one believed there to be real, a sight to make one shiver. Wow. The grand performance of Shapira, however, was, um, let's see, uh, one of the gentlemen put a question about the leather 
and Shapira to show him what it was like, tore off a fragment nearly an inch in diameter and held it out in his hand. Isn't that amazing? Then, then, let's just let's yep. just stop and consider that just for one second before I know what you're going to tell us, but yep. Um, yep. It, it would be enough today. Can you imagine uh, in the Israel Museum or something like that if someone tore a piece of the of the Isaiah like, scroll or something like that? I'll just pass this one around, and people would stand in horror, absolutely horrified that such a thing happened. These days, it's white gloves, and it's all very, very. I know. You know <laughs> so this is the yeah. way that he's. And, and what do you think? Do you think it's, it's because there is such an air of confidence about him uh, in, in doing this? Uh, what, 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 is, what does it suggest I, you to you know, about mixed. his state of I'm, mind? I'm mixed, man. Yeah. What, one side of me, one side of me says he, first of all, they know nothing about ancient scrolls. No one has ever seen the Dead Sea Scrolls. There are there is no protocol. They don't know how to handle them. They don't know. I mean, he's he really wants to to show these. He's a salesman. Mm -hmm. He wants to sell them, and and so I think he just peels off a piece of it. Probably, I think he's very smart. I think he knows of the sixteen pieces mm -hmm. um, where the letters are because oh, he stroked all of them with uh, leather, so he knows this isn't any writing. Yeah, but. It's still a shock even to Simpson, who knows nothing about the Dead Sea Scrolls either. He says mm. this he really did to a document he declared to be as old as 900 B.C. Mm -hmm. Now, that's interesting. He suggested in this meeting, evidently, that, uh, or at least that was Simpson's takeaway, is that it mm. could be as old as 900 B.C., but remember, they're all fresh on this 900 BC date because of the Salon, I mean the uh, Moabite Stella, mm. which has has similar writing on it. Mm. Okay, now this is uh, again a sign that that uh, Simpson is a little joker. Bullen was standing beside me, and I whispered in his ear, "Hey." This there is a precious fragment worth at least five hundred pounds torn off. Yeah. This estimate was, of course, based on Shapira's valuation of a million for the whole. Now I have to stop here. Everybody, everybody says I put it in the book mm -hmm. because the reports and because of this, the story is is that Shapira offered for sale this presumably ancient document for a million pounds in 1883. I think at the time I wrote the book, uh, that estimate would have been in 2021 numbers, well over $120 million, mm. right? Now, let me just say, remember not too long ago, we had a the one of the oldest uh, Masoretic manuscripts sell, for thirty-eight million dollars, so it, let's assume that this is ancient. And I'll, yeah, the Sassoon. Mm. If if in fact this did turn out to be as old and an ancient and authentic document of a piece of Torah, then it might go for a hundred million. Mm. But one thing I have to say, and this is for a couple of reasons, I, I had a long Zoom call today, and among the participants was Matthew Hamilton, oh, yeah. the, the guy we, we, we talk about all the time. And by the way, Jono, he says that he listens, he watches these. Oh, so good that deal. means that we have to be very accurate, very mm. accurate, because he's going to bust us if not. That's right. But he, he, he's proven to me, I'm, I'm convinced now, that Shapira didn't say... I want a million pounds for this. Mm. Be, but that that word got out, and it got out early because here's Simpson who was in the room. He's saying that Shapira values it at a million. I'll give you two theories. One, this is my thought. Maybe Shapira said, and I ran this by Matthew today. He has another mm. idea. We're, we're guessing, but here's what I think Shapira could have said. Gentlemen, if this is proven to be ancient and authentic, as old as I say it is, it could be worth, I don't know, maybe maybe a million. Mm. Now, uh, Matthew says maybe one thought is that back in Germany, a million marks was a number that came up. Now, a million marks is not a million pounds. It's much, much lower. 
But it could be that he had the number one million in his head from some stuff that came out of the German meetings. Possibly. But either way, either way, this story gets out and it's told to this day. Mm. A million pounds. All right, so this is what Simpson says. Uh, He doesn't say a million pounds. He says uh, a valuation of a million for the whole. Now, I'm, I'm getting close. At one time, the bottle of spirits tumbled on the table and made a great mess, the manuscript getting a full share of it. Of course, <laughs> nothing could be settled uh, regarding the claims of the manuscript at such a meeting, and it was finally decided that D. Ginsburg should take these in charge and mm. keep them at the British Museum while he inspected them. Ginsburg carried them off. And the documents, while I write, are still in the museum. William Simpson, 23 January, 1884. I'm going to suggest that uh, right. perhaps perhaps Shapiro had a little bit of du- Dutch courage uh, prior to his um, <laughs> prior to putting on a show, because uh, it just sounds like he's a little bit overconfident, you know, tearing a little bit off here, accidentally knocking over the bottle, all of this sort of thing. Um, uh, nevertheless. Uh, Everyone's quite excited. What is the takeaway from this meeting, Ross? The takeaway, uh, as I understood it, when I read through all the accounts, I get the impression, again, Shapiro's on a high. He's come away from mm. three very good scholars, capable scholars. Uh, and before that, remember, he has the approval of Schroeder, uh, who is a well-known expert in Phoenician writing. Mm. So he he's building his courage and confidence that this is real. Okay, so it didn't sell in Germany yet. Now he's in England. He knows that these Brits are very, very uh, big on the Bible and history, and he feels confident after meeting with uh, Besant. He's He may even be standing over his shoulder while Besant writes the invitation. Uh, and, and remember the wording where Besant says that this is actually uh, a, a purportedly very ancient manuscript. So I think the takeaway is this. When Shapira put his head on the pillow that night in the hotel, and I even know where he stayed. He always stayed at the Cannon Street Hotel in London, very mm-hmm. nice hotel. I think he's, he's resting very confidently knowing that it's just a matter of time. In fact, we're going to get into in the next episode uh, letters back and forth from Shapira to his wife and daughter Miriam uh, back in Jerusalem. Look, he is confident that they're going to validate his scroll. Mm. He, I think he knows Ginsburg is uh, already into this. He, he's almost certain that it's going to be declared a an authentic document. So things are th- looking up for Shapiro. Things are looking yep. up, uh, and I think this is from Bassant's uh, autobiography, uh, and you mentioned this in the closing page of Chapter 6, uh, that uh, another, quote, prof- uh, professor of Hebrew exclaims with conviction, this is one of the few things which could not be forgery and a fraud. Do we know, does Bassant identify that uh, professor? Do we know anything more about that at all? He he does not. He doesn't name him, but we do get we do get that impression that when Shapira finished his as as Simpson called it his grand performance, when they walked out of that room, people were excited. Not only was Shapira feeling good and confident, but the people felt like they had witnessed and seen uh, something real and ancient in their very presence. So imagine mm. they're all standing around this table while he puts this on. Now, here's something that I find interesting is that Condor, th- this is also in Bassant's um, um, uh, biography, autobiography, Condor, who had been very quietly only putting in a little question from time to time, spoke. I observe, he said, that all the points objected to by German critics have vanished in this new epic-making Truvel. The geography is not confused, and Moses does not record his own death. Mm -hmm. All right, and so then the response to that, now remember this is Bassant writing years later, and he already knows that the answer is it's fake. He recalls this conversation. He said, well... I asked, for more was in his face. 
And I know, I believe, back to Condor, all the caves of Moab, and they are all damp and earthy. There is not a dry cave in the country. Back to Basant. Then you think precisely. Now, what does that mean? You, you get the impression reading this that there's this secret conversation. So the, the door closes, and, and, and here's Condor, and he goes, hey, you know... This thing really makes sense. In some ways, it's got this, it's got that. It matches what the critics are finding. Then you, you, you think it's what? What? Do you, what? Let us in on it. What are you saying? So, what do you think about that? I well, mean, it's it's kind I mean, of strange. That, that, that closing comment would suggest that um, uh, it, it cannot be because you know the the, the caves are damp and that so nothing can last that long. But it, th- this uh, reminds me. I think of a conversation you and I, it was you and I, and you had mentioned to me that, and correct me if I'm wrong, so this is just in the back of my mind, right. that Condor had actually visited Qumran and had stumbled uh, in, a, and excavated only, uh, yep. you know, with hundreds of metres from uh, Cave One, uh, for example. And, yep. uh, and here it would appear that he's of the opinion that there are no caves that could support uh, the longevity of such uh, documents, um, and yet he was only many meters away from making the greatest discovery of all time, and he didn't. I know. Do it. Am I, I right yeah. about that? You, you're right about, about that. that. In fact, I, I I included that in in the book later. Now, here's the thing: uh, Condor is exaggerative in his comment if he actually says this. I've been in every cave. Now we do know that he says something similar in a report that comes out. Later, this is July of 1883. August the 18th, I believe, he publishes an article in the Times of London where he basically says something similar. I've been in all those caves. This is it. Nothing could survive in these caves. As you point out, I bring it up in the book. Not only uh, is is, uh, Condor that close to these caves at Qumran, but so is Claremont Gano. They're Mm -hmm. all right there. But Mm -hmm. to claim you've been in every cave... Now, what we do know is that east of the Jordan, east of the Jordan Rift, you're going to have, particularly close to the Dead Sea, there is more rainfall on the eastern side than there is on the western. We know this, Mm -hmm. and and so did um, uh, Condor. But, But what we're actually knowing now, what we know, if it matches the location, as we read in Shapira's several accounts of the location of the discovery, and you know this because we've been there, mm. it's well inland. It's more toward the further east you go, the drier, more desert uh, environment mm. you're in along that Wadi Mujib. The Wadi Mujib is this massive, like a Grand Canyon, Canyon which mm. at times has a good amount of water in it. Mm. Uh, so, but this particular location where it was discovered, when people first heard about, oh, you found it in the Wadi Muji? Impossible. Impo- there's water in the Wadi. Nothing could survive. It's too damp there. But it's high up and it's far east. In fact, mm. it's 30 minutes east of Aurora and Dibon. Mm. So, uh, yeah. So, so, but yes, this this account is interesting to me because it's just kind of hard to figure out what they're saying. You know, do they, mm. you know, what are they actually saying with this? Fascinating. So the next chapter, Ross, chapter seven, uh, we're dealing with Ginsburg's analysis mm. of, of the scroll, which goes on for a number of weeks, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, he mm-hmm. he takes it at the end of July. Uh, he they, they take possession of the manuscript Shapira stays in London during this time. Shapira's at the Cannon Street Hotel, mm-hmm. uh, right down the street from the, the British Museum. And uh, Ginsburg sets up shop to work in a back office of the British Museum. And uh, we're, that's where we're going to pick up next week. We're going to talk and about that investigation and what That's we what we're going to talk about. And and his updates were, were daily front page news, right, in the um, that's right. Athenium, the Athenium. And uh, so we're going to be talking about that next week, the unfolding of uh, Ginsburg's analysis, Chapter 7, in this fine book. If you don't have it, once again, uh, you'll find it on Amazon, uh, hardcover, paperback, um, Kindle. You can get it straight away. And, of course, an audio version is available now. Uh, yep. that's, 
that's it. So there you go. Uh, by the way, boys and girls, here's some news. Um, speaking of going to the Wadding Museum, um, the Tanakh tour. Uh, we're setting dates. Yes. We're, we're looking at this with uh, we're, we're, with some seriousness. Uh, it's available uh, for uh, to, to reserve your seats. You can place a deposit on it, and we're looking at uh, late February, early March. You can look at the details there by going to the website tanaktours.com. Tanaktours.com. Uh, we'll put a link in uh, in the comments. That's right. Um, Absolutely. Anything else you want to close with, Ross? No, I, th I think this is great. I'm excited about this. Look, the accounts in Chapter uh, 6 of the book, uh, there are a lot of footnotes or a lot of references where you can go read these for yourself, but we wanted to give you just kind of a feel of being in the room in its first appearance in England. And like you said, we're about to get into a month-long investigation. We're going to talk about people who come to see this manuscript. It's the talk of the world. Uh, mm -hmm. Imagine there's no CNN, there's no Fox, there's nothing like that. But newspapers around the world are carrying this. And, and so I think the next chapter is called The Man of the Hour. And that's what we're going to be talking about as Shapira becomes the man of the hour. Jono, I say we take mm -hmm. this conversation uh, to Over the Yakad, and we'll spend some time now. and we'll talk about that. If you're not a member of the Yakad, all you have to do is click the join button under this video and you'll see how to do that. We're going to go over there right now for a little bit of Q&A. We'll be back this time next week with the infamous saga of the Shapira Scroll. And until then, have a good one. Have a great week. <laughs>